volunteer committee with us. So we've got Wind is not there. Judy in the back, raise your hand there. Mm -hmm. Pat Peacock right there. And Cynthia's in the back, and Destiny's right here holding a very careful Facebook Live uh, phone for us, <laughs> and then a couple other folks as well. So thanks for joining us, whether you're on Zoom this evening or here in person, we're happy to see you. I think we have a few new folks here this evening. If you are and you've never been to Green Roots before, maybe raise your hand. Or did I make that? There we go. Yeah, good. Welcome oh, for the first time. Right here. I can't clap because I have to hold the microphone. So first of all, thanks for your patience as we wind our way through the different ways we've been doing Green Greeks over the last few months. We've been trying different methods, you know, being hybrid, keeping Zoom going, and trying to open up a little bit for uh, folks to come in person, thanks to Zach and to Dukes. So that reminds me, we want to thank our co-sponsor, Sir Dukes Ale House, who's our host for years. <laughs> and then also Environmental Defenders of McHenry County, who takes care of all our publicity and mailing, and Dukes does some publicity too. So yes. that's <laughs> Remember about Green Drinks, or if you're new to us, remember Green Drinks is, a, is still an international event all over the world. Lots of people are gathering at different times to build community, educate one another, and then find ways to connect back to the community. And that's what we've been doing here for 12 years now, and plus some. And um, there are over 350 Green Drinks that are active, it seems, at this point. So some have made it through COVID, and others had to disband a little bit because they didn't places to be, but we're still thrilled to be part of something that is international and diverse and important um, in educating folks. So we always like to tell you about the new ones in the world. So Hexham United Kingdom is one new place. Has anybody been over there that way? United Kingdom, I bet, though, right? Over there? there we go, right? And then Santa Cruz, California. Has anybody been to Santa Cruz, California? And they've joined up as well, so it's nice to add them to the list. Next month is really January, believe it or not, right? <laughs> New Year, and we'll still be doing things, and I just realized I forgot what our program is, and Destiny yeah. knows. Yeah. Destiny. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so in January, we will actually have the Environmental Defenders um, uh, waste reduction team presenting and they are going to talk about ways you can reduce single use waste such as plastic, um, styrofoam and things like that and uh, what you can use to replace a lot of those items. So we're really looking forward to that and it sh we should learn a lot I think. So Zach I think we'll be a part of that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you and I just read about that today and totally forgot already. So, thank you. And that means we're informal here, so not to worry, and you can cheer, clap when it's a good time as well. Um, so we have three speakers this evening, yeah. yes, and Zach is going to introduce them. Just a quick note, um, what will happen this evening is that we'll have three different presentations. I know you're looking forward to it. It's going to be fun, right? And then once they're done, each one will uh, give you a chance to ask questions, and then we'll wrap their portion up at the end. They're going to exit. And for those of you that are staying here, um, you'll get a chance to do some tasting out in the other room. And then we'll also do some announcements at that time while they set up. So uh, that is our agenda this evening. So again, welcome, and I want to introduce you. Um, so yeah, if we're talking about um, uh, food, wine, and beer, my three favorite topics. Um, <laughs> we, uh, around this time of year, we're having to make a lot of decisions about, um, about buying those types of things and serving family and friends, and um, it's nice this year that we can gather more um, uh, with, with less risk, and that's much nicer. So I'm sure that a lot of people are planning on what they're going to do, they're probably not ordering their Christmas meal from Dukes this year. 
So we, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do and how um, that can influence some of your dining decisions um, that you are making at home when you decide um, what you're going to put on your menu. Um, I want to take a little bit of a segue. Um, we, I, a lot of people ask us where our logo comes from, and it kind of gets missed and lost in translation at some points in time. So um, it is based on a molecular structure of chlorophyll. And the importance of that to me um, came from my Michael Pollan's uh, omnivore's dilemma. But uh, it was all about harnessing the energy of the sun, and we rely on animals that graze on grasses um, that are outside in the sun, um, and we rely on them to gather those nutrients for us, where we get those amazing omega-3s, and we rely a lot on proteins for that. Um, there are vegetable sources for this thing, but also the vegetable sources need sunlight and photosynthesis and chlorophyll. Um, is a process or part of that process as well. So we thought the logo kind of stood for everything food and the importance of food and how far our um, system has gotten away um, from that focus and how we don't get the nutrients that we need anymore um, based on the food. So um, that is one of the problems um, with our food system. Um, another huge problem with our food system is the waste that it produces, especially restaurants. Um, we only use the nice parts of the tomato. We, um, we have to present things in a beautiful way. There's a lot of trim and waste and peeling and things like that that end up going to the garbage and most of the stuff ends up going to the landfill. And most restaurants barely even have um, recycling programs. So asking restaurants to eliminate waste and, um, by composting is um, pretty far-fetched. Um, they're scared of the training and the costs and space of things like that. So waste is a huge problem within the restaurant industry. Um, so uh, when you're planning your meals at home, be, you know you always have to be considerate of that. And I know that some people compost at home. Does anybody in here compost at home? Holy oh. oh, <laughs> oh, 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 God! That is awesome. Yeah, I've been, yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. I assume all of you already recycle, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have to ask that much more. But um, composting, that is huge. Um, you know, I think that even probably a year ago, there may have been even half that many hands come up. So um, I do see a lot of dedicated green drinkers here, but um, <laughs> we, it's, it's crazy how much that has grown as well. But you don't see it as much in the restaurant industry. Um, you know, we, we've had our hurdles to deal with, but it is commercially available for us, and we're doing everything we can to encourage them to do so. so if you're not already composting at home, just be considerate of waste. Um, when you're buying things, all the packaging, usually processed foods have the most packaging, so try to best buy less processed foods, and that'll also help with um, you know, getting those nutrients in. So, um, so those are some easier steps. Um, and um, waste elimination, and then the nutrients I touched on. And then also um, the environmental impact of growing these things, namely meat and meat processing. Um, it does take a tremendous amount of energy. Um, the last I heard, it takes 10 calories to produce um, uh, every one calorie of meat that we consume, um, uh, that's beef. So the amount of energy it takes um, is 10 times the amount that we get out of it. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about conventional raised meat. So there's choices that we can make to bring that number down and um, decrease the blueprint of those meat items. I, you know, I, I, anybody who's able to become vegan and um, commit to that and uh, is able to harness the nutrients that they need to um, to do that, uh, I applaud them. Um, but you know, making some decisions in your life, like um, meatless Mondays, or you know, taking the meat out of the center of the plate and having it become a side dish, or some easier things that you can do without having to eliminate it completely from your diet. And then also things like um, eliminating beef um, can have an environmental impact. I know that there might be some um, personal feelings sometimes come around that, that you only have to kill one cow or one animal to produce so much meat as opposed to you know, 20 chickens for the amount of meat you get. So it's, you know, there, that might be a debate for some people. But um, it does take way less energy to produce chicken um, than it does to produce um, beef. So uh, environmentally speaking, um, I know that that can have a huge impact. 
Um, and then, so when planning your meals, I think the importance um, of your decisions, uh, well, will have an impact, but I think it's important that um, we make those side dishes, you know, our, the things that we're proud of. I think that I see more and more people coming to Thanksgiving dinners and, you know, they're really proud of the, you know, the, the butternut squash mac and cheese they made or the new casserole they made. And it's really cool to see the vegetables become the pride and joy instead of, you know, the, the person deep frying the turkey, which is absolutely delicious. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it's very cool to see that more and more people cooking at home um, not good for business, but more and more people coming in <laughs> and, you know, and uh, taking pride in those types of things. Um, I will say this one thing about Thanksgiving that I was um, hadn't thought about until this year, and we, we talk about you know, how many meals can you get out of one chicken, and then you see Thanksgiving, and it's like kind of like it's a, um, a snapshot of that because. It, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that after they cook the turkey and then the labor they go through to um, boil it and then pour, peel the chicken off the bones and maybe they boil the bones even one more time to make a bone broth and the, how many meals they get out of that one turkey and I'm like oh my gosh that, that's a great example of how we can you know utilize one thing over and over again and make multiple dishes and really stretch it um, and that you know um, uh, is, is really important about food. So I think, you know, at, at having this recent meal where we were able to make several meals out of one uh, animal really uh, brings us back to the sustainability and um, the real way we should be um, cooking it. Um, is that about 10 minutes? <laughs> um, I do wanna leave some time for questions um, so that each of the speakers, so nobody forgets their questions for each speaker. Um, if there's something I missed or something somebody would like to ask, uh, please go ahead. Or more about Dukes, whatever the case may be, you have me here. So, um, yes, Pat. Uh, the fish you have on your menu now, tell us about that. Oh, um, so, that you great question. question? Yeah, sorry? Oh, repeat the question. Thank you. All right. Um, the question was, um, uh, tell us uh, about the fish that you're now serving on your menu. So we now serve um, superior fresh salmon. We used to get organic fed salmon all the way from Scotland. Um, not the most sustainable, um, but it, it was farm raised. And I'll talk about farm raised in just a minute. Um, but now we're able to get it locally. We get it from Superior Fresh, which you can look up. Um, they grow greens um, for restaurants and they, they use aquaponics to do so, and they actually started farming um, salmon to do that. So they are able to produce delicious fish, and you know their original game plan was to produce uh, uh, aquaponic lettuce, which they sell as well, but um, their fish uh, uh, products um, ended up selling really well as well. So, um, and it's local. Um, and it's delicious, so we're really proud and excited to be serving um, that fish on our menu. And they do very sustainable things, um, like purifying the water and things like that, so the water comes out better than it went in. Um, and then they get to use those nutrients as well for um, the uh, lettuce that they grow. Um, so yeah, fish can be a very um, difficult subject, I know, but I know that a lot of people are very scared of farmed, raised, farm raised, but the fact is is that we're overfishing and the way to go is if we're going to continue to eat fish on this planet is to support um, the fisheries that are farming them and doing it the right way. So catfish is very um, delicious. I think it's underrated and uh, that's one of the ones that's uh, very easy to grow and farm. Um, now you can get the superior fresh salmon. Um, uh, and then fish that uh, have uh, large amounts of so fish like uh, white fish and Lake Superior um, has plenty of those and so it's a sustainable fish that you can get out there but usually most of the brands or the fish that you hear the most about are the ones that you need to stay away from the swordfish the marlin and shrimp especially um, those types of things um, cause a lot of damage um, in the process of fishing them um, and their populations are in severe decline so, uh, yes so you kind of joked about it a few minutes ago about 
holidays and your business, but what can you tell us what it's like with Thanksgiving and Christmas, like, and and people coming to you as a restaurant for those kinds of meals? Does um, that happen? How much does that happen? Um, yeah, I mean, we're we're technically around those holidays. We're 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 much busier because people are bringing family to town, and we do. Um, it, it's a really, as you can attest, it's it's a really great time of year to be working. It's like we see old employees coming back to town. And, um, we saw old friends, and they gather with more people, and um, it's it's always um, a joyous and a lot of fun. So, it, and yes, we do, we do stay very busy during the holidays, and I kind of was referencing almost last year where we were making Thanksgiving meals for people to take home and things like that. So, but uh, yeah, we 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 do very well over the holidays. We count on this time to be busy. Yes, um, you had touched on. Uh, composting. And I was wondering whether you guys um, take advantage of like a commercial uh, composting company to handle your waste, or whether you are handling that in house, and how how available is like um, is commercial composting in this region? Um, it is readily available. We just switched to Prairie Land, their waste disposal company that provides us. So they do our recycling, they do our composting and they do um, our regular garbage. And to put it all in reference, we have a six yard container that gets picked up three times a week for our recycling. That's our largest container. And then we have two one yard containers, one for regular garbage and then one for composting. Our composting gets picked up five days a week and then our regular garbage only gets picked up once a week. So um, that kind of puts it into reference as how much waste we I do want to leave plenty of time for everybody else. Thank you for the questions. Um, who's going next? You're, oh, okay. Um, Beth from Chris Lake Brewing. She is the general manager over there. I will let her introduce herself. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Beth, I've done this a couple of times before. It's great to be back. Um, so yeah, I'm Beth. I'm the general manager of Crystal Lake Brewing. We opened in August of 2014. So we will be celebrating eight years in 2022. Wow. Awesome. Um, I've been very proud to be working with our brewmaster. I worked with him at another brewery for 12 years. So when he opened up his own place here in Crystal Lake, he asked me to come on board and it's just a lot of fun. Um, but it's, it's what I do and what I love. Um, in January, they actually gave me some shares, so I'm a little baby owner of <laughs> Crystal Lake Brewing, which is awesome. Um, so it's been cool to have a, a heavy hand in how our tap room operates. One thing about Crystal Lake Brewing is we're a production brewery, so it's really important for us, especially here locally in town, to allow the restaurants that are around us do what they do really well. We don't need to have a restaurant. We make delicious beer, and we want to get it... Uh, distributed, um, but we so we're pretty much just only Illinois. We're distributed in over a thousand accounts in Northern Illinois. Um, but what better to get beer made right in your hometown, right? Yeah. It's as local and as green as can be. <laughs> uh, so we're very very proud. When we first opened in 2014, well 2015, that first year, we produced about 1,500 barrels, and this year we will be producing 4,000. Wow. So that's a, a great, um, you know, throughout the years, just keeping at it and, and increasing. Um, COVID was definitely, you know, interesting for all of us. Um, one of the things that we did through COVID, um, we made the choice to keep glassware in our tap room. So we did not move to plastic. And some people didn't agree with that, but we feel that our glasses are clean and we didn't want the waste. For our, yeah. for our environment. Um, so that's a big one. Um, prior to COVID, I had eliminated plastic glassware for our water station. I fought right when we opened to have recycle bins. And I mean, we get pizza boxes and all kinds of big bottles and stuff. And we as a company produce and, you know, we use cardboard carriers and six pack rings um, and all of that. And we, we recycle those things. You can bring our six pack rings back to us and we give them back to the company they chop them up and make new ones so that's a really good thing um, we made as a company the, ch the choice to package our beer in cans in aluminum because that is the better recyclable way better than glass we actually um, 
last year there was an aluminum can shortage but we made um, every effort to continue with cans and we started purchasing blank cans and then moved to we actually purchased an old bottling line and took that labeler off the bottling line and hooked it up to our canning line so we could just add labels to the blank cans and it really saved us and we're actually keeping that model for most of our beers um, the, some of the core beers that we have like our beach blonde 50% of what we produce as a company is beach blonde so <laughs> it won the 20, um, 2016 bronze medal of world beer cup so it's a, it's a really great beer um, but yeah so so those are still painted cans but for the most part we're doing a lot of, of the blank cans with the labeler which is helpful um, we have also moved from, we used to get our base malt from Germany and that's expensive <laughs> and not great for the, the earth. So what we do now is we have moved to uh, a sourcing from Midwest, so we get all of our grain from Milwaukee. So that's a lot better for us. Um, and then we take those spent grains that we, um, after we're done with the, the brew, we give those to local farmers. We have a, a farmer out of Huntley that we send our grain to and those cows have, there's no alcohol in the grain. It's okay, <laughs> the cows are not, they're not tipsy. Um, but it's a great nutritional feed for them. And so that's a good thing. Um, we also switched our boiler system. So we now are producing our beer with a steam boiler that's high efficiency. So that's another um, added point. Um, but yeah, we, we're doing a lot of things that as much as we can <laughs> as a company to be as green as we can be. So thanks for having me here. I really appreciate being able to talk about it. Um, one of the things that we release in at this time of year is our Boathouse Reserve collection. And that is our Imperial Stout. It's what I've brought for you to sample this evening. For those Zoomers, I apologize that I can't give it to you through the, <laughs> through the screen there. Um, but that's a really cool beer because it's, it's an Imperial Stout that we uh, put into bourbon barrels. And those bourbon barrels are also sourced from the Midwest. Um, so those we get yearly, and then the, the beer is aged in those bourbon barrels. And every year around this time, we release that beer. And we will do a vintage in bourbon barrels, we'll do some rye whiskey barrels, and then um, the past few years we've been doing a variant where we blend the rye whiskey and the bourbon stouts and then we will add different adjuncts to it to make a variation. This year's, um, we actually added cocoa nibs from Ethereal Confections right here in Woodstock, so local chocolate is in that beer. We love Mary and all of the staff over there, they do such a great job, it's really cool to work with them. Um, and we also add coffee, roasted coffee, vanilla bean, and coconut. So I have some of that um, for you to sample. Um, so it's just a, a great thing. Um, it's cool to repurpose those bourbon barrels. You know, once the bourbon's out of it, they can't use them again for bourbon. Um, so we put our beer in it, and then the the oak character and all of the you know bourbon or rye will go into that beer as well. The neat thing about it is that we empty those barrels, and that you'll see them. We have stacks of them outside of the brewery right now. We are selling them <laughs> at the moment um, because this is the time of year to get them. So bourbon barrels can be repurposed for so many different things. And you can make furniture, you can make bars, you can, you know, all of those staves can be brought apart. Um, we actually, as check presenters at, at the tap room, I we cut up staves and I have people sign their checks on our bourbon barrel staves that our beer was in, you know. So there's all different things you can do and repurpose that way. Um, so that's that's about our boathouse reserve. Um, one thing to note is in 2019 we did win the silver medal for our bourbon barrel aged stout, and that's a, at the at the festival of barrel aged beers. It's a competition that happens in Chicago, and it's a huge competition. And we won in their biggest category, so we have the second best, you know, from that year. And I actually have that as well if you'd like to sample it. So. I guess I, I don't know if that was about time, but I would be happy to answer any questions if you if you have any. Yes. How much is a barrel? <laughs> the question was how much is a barrel? Normally um, we pay normally one hundred and seventy five dollars each barrel, um, but what usually we will resell them for anywhere from seventy five to one hundred dollars. It depends on how many we have and how many we need to move and things like that. This year we are pr 
pretty um, ambitious to move them. So they're actually um, only $50 right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. Good Christmas. Yeah, it's great Christmas. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think that's it. Yes, one. I have a question for my dear husband. Sure. Why can't you use, reuse the barrels for beer again? That's a great question. So um, with the beer that we make, we are looking for a particular, you know, we want to um, have consistency. And once you put that beer in the oak, it's going to, that beer that was in there is going to soak up all of the character. And then, so you've, it's just kind of spent. You can use it as a, a second um, vessel for something. You, you can do it for all different wine, coffee, all, you know, different things, I guess, um, but not beer. If you want to get the same character, we could do a second use of it, but it wouldn't be the same thing. So. Um, we've actually, the, it's a good question because we have a couple of the barrels that we're using a second time, but it's not for the Imperial Stout, it's for our Belgian Whip Beer, or our Dunkel Lager, or something that might not need that much of the character of the bourbon, um, but is still barrel aged. So, But if you're looking for that bourbon or that rye character to really come through, you only want to use it once. So, yeah. Okay. I'm assuming you like beer. I do. I do love okay. beer. Um, so, if you were stranded on an island, which of your, which of your beers would you want? To oh, that's a great question. Okay. So the funny thing is that I stopped drinking over two years ago, <laughs> completely. But um, I started drinking those light beers, and throughout the years, I've been in the beer brewing industry 22 years now, and I have acquired the taste for hops. I love, love hops. Oh, yes. And so I am a Slalom King girl all of the way. <laughs> yes. Um, it's, it's a great beer. It's very well balanced. Um, it has a nice malty backbone, um, but is complemented by those hops. So that's what I love to drink. Um, but we, our brewmaster is very traditional, so, you know, there's plenty of breweries that are putting out the the sours and the hazies and all of the stuff that the milkshake beers um, but he believes in producing a classic style and then you can play around a little bit um, so we have light beers dark beers hoppy beers all different something for everyone on the menu so okay awesome thank, thank you, you so much for having me I'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, Brian Noche of Matera Wine. Uh, I guess before I get started, as far as the barrels, we have the same thing in the wine industry. Mm -hmm. We just use the fancy term neutral once they're used. Ah, yeah. So it, it, our description is a brand new toasted oak barrel mm -hmm. is going to, you're going to leach a lot of those flavors out of it in your first use. So once it's been used one, two, three times, they'll call it neutral one, neutral two, neutral three. And we'll use it down the line with our wines that we don't want to impart a strong toasted oak, but we'll get a little bit of tannin out of it, which mm -hmm. acts as a preservative in the wine. So we'll use it to not make a mochi, but to still let that wine uh, age in the bottle a little bit. Sure. So I just, if That's you're great. talking about barrels, yeah. yeah. But we'll talk later, because I think okay. at some point a Chardonnay barrel would be something for a Belgian. Absolutely. Okay. We've done some stuff, we have some, some aging in, in red wine barrels right now. Okay. Yeah. I, I'd be curious with the white. Everyone's doing the red, but I okay. think Chardonnay <laughs> with like apricot notes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that'd be fun. delicious. Um, so I'm Brian, I'm a <laughs> national sales director for Matera Wines. Um, we are a, a 90 acre vineyard in Oak Knoll District in Napa Valley. Has anyone been to Napa? Okay, good. Okay, we got a few. So we're in the in the valley floor. So Napa truly is a valley. We've got the Mayacamas and the Bacchus mountain ranges going up but two to three thousand feet. And then on the valley floor where we are, it's actually lower than here. It's about 180 feet above sea level uh, where we're growing. Um, the vineyard is owned out of McHenry County as well. So the Brian and John Cunat bought this vineyard in 2007. Yeah. Um, and immediately ripped everything up and replanted it. It was planted for um, quantity, not quality. It was a farm. So it was a Merlot farm. They grew grapes, they sold them to a handful of brands in Napa Valley. 
and we just think it was a magical place and wanted to kind of put our own stamp on it. So everything was, was ripped up, replanted between 2007 and 2010. So now all of our vines are, are at least 11 years old. Um, so I started with the company about eight years ago. Uh, I'm the only person that's ever been in sales for the company. So before me, we just sold direct to consumer. So you either visited our tasting room or you jumped on our website and we shipped it to you. Um, that is kind of the, the traditional way to grow a brand. You don't just buy expensive land in Napa, make wine, and start immediately selling it to, to every restaurant in the United States. So we've been slowly growing. Illinois was our first state because we're Illinois owned. And I grew up about a mile that way and went to high school about a mile that way. So <laughs> I started my job the first four years, I did everything by car. So we started Illinois, Iowa was our second state, Michigan, Wisconsin, so I did all the Midwest. So kind of the opposite of what a traditional Napa brand would do where they would start in New York and LA, and Iowa would be maybe the last one. Um, Iowa was our second one. Since then, we've grown to just opened our 13th state in South Carolina, uh, opening in January. So we started with 1,000 cases of wine. We're making 11,000 cases of wine this year. It sounds great, the growth is great, but that's still, we are a baby in Napa. Um, if you go to you know, uh, Whole Foods or Binnie's and just pick an average Napa bottle off the shelf, they're probably making 90,000 plus. So we're still in the growth phase. Growth phase. Um, the, the owner grew up farming. So he grew up in McHenry. Uh, he worked at farms on the Fox River all through high school. So he would literally drive his bike to a farm before high school, work for a couple hours, drive it back to the farm after high school, work for a couple hours, go home, eat, and repeat the process during the week. Uh, his family owned some farms along the Fox River. So he always kind of wanted farming to be the focus of Matera. There is 502 brands in Napa right now. And there's everything from the billionaire with an opulent winery who doesn't care about the farming, all the way down to the extremely organic small farmer that makes 500 cases and farms it themselves. So there's everything in the middle. We are a farm-based winery. Um, we are 100% sustainably farmed. Uh, we've been doing that from the beginning. Uh, we got our Napa Green Winery Certificate in 2017 and have been uh, gotten that every year since then. It took us four years to start that process. So the Napa Green Winery was started by the Napa Valley Vintners Association. As originally we thought it was an alternative to organic, but if you look at them side by side on a pros and cons list, I believe the Napa Valley Vintners has gone farther. So there, it's going beyond what chemicals you use to spray your vines or inject in your soils. It's going to how are you lowering your usage and so when I say usage, they come out and they test us really for three things is the main core and then it goes down to a lot of, um, a lot of extra smaller things, but it's, it's your energy usage, your water usage, and your greenhouse gas emissions from your winery itself. So it took us four years, but we're testing in the top 5% in Napa Valley right now. Um, then they go even farther, they go down to the hand soaps in your guest bathroom, are they green certified? <laughs> The soaps that you clean the floor of, of, the, um, of the tank room and the fermentation room has to be green certified. Uh, they come out, they test your, um, your compost field. So we have a, almost a full acre that is just a compost field. So that's where everything that we're using that, that can't be sold or repurposed to some other way goes into the compost field. Uh, we have used every bit of nature that we can to try to use the, the least amount of chemicals possible. So everything from certain bugs that attack vines uh, hate mint. So we'll get industrial sprays of mint oil. And if anyone here grows mint or made the crazy mistake of planting a little bit of mint on your side of your yard, uh, you have an entire yard of mint, uh, and you can smell it from your neighbor's house. So mint is a great thing for specific bugs. Um, our biggest pest at the winery are what's called sharpshooters. They look like kind of a long, thin um, mosquito, and they love to eat straight from the vines and the leaves specifically. And as photosynthesis is, leaves are the, the core to that. Um, so we found out that bluebirds love them. I mean, 
like we didn't find that out. The French probably found that out 400 years ago. <laughs> uh, we have we have we have bluebird houses planted every 50 yards throughout the winery. Um, so there's over 300 of them. We're about half occupied for those. Um, the furry pests that are a problem: the jackrabbits, the voles, the moles, the mice. Uh, owls love to eat them. So we have eight owl houses. Six are occupied right now. Um, they're right on the Napa River. So I'm really hoping we can get some good video where we can get an owl bringing a jackrabbit up to the house, but maybe someday we'll get that video. We do have some uh, wild game cameras set up out there to try to get pictures of them doing their work. Um, we are, to this day, still dry farmed. Uh, we're lucky we have the Napa River on our property. So if you've been to Napa, if you come out of the city of Napa, the river's right there on the city. If you were in a canoe and go five miles north, you'd be on our property. So we have, um, the wine we'll taste later is actually planted on the right bank of the Napa River, and we call it right bank. So we'll taste that uh, a little bit later. Um, we were blessed in 2019 to get a congressional award for our recycling practice. So we have a California legislature uh, it's called Excellence in Recycling. So there's eight wineries in Napa that have achieved that, and we've had it for three years now. Um, for, for that award and for the Napa Valley Vintners Green Winery Certificate, it's a yearly audit. So they will come out just like an accountant would, and they'll spend a couple days at our winery. They'll test the soil. Um, they'll look at all of our cleaners. They'll, they'll look at the energy usage at the solar power. So we are um, it's about 75% uh, solar powered. It's amazing because the winery is huge and it's completely full of panels. And it still doesn't do 100% of it. And California's got a lot of sun. There's, there's, we don't have any more space. Eventually there's talks about putting a little field out there. Um, but if you can imagine in Napa Valley at $300,000 an acre plus, <laughs> to put a solar panels on an entire acre of it is really going to cut down on your production. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot, th this is a unique presentation for me because all of mine deal with selling wine and they're not selling any, so <laughs> I kind of like this better. Um, but I, uh, often when I'm doing wine dinners or presentations or wine festivals, people are asking about why not go organic? Are you guys going to be USDA certified organic? We have one major obstacle for that, and that's we can't plant anything within a football field and a half from any source of water. Hmm. And we own both sides of the Napa River for about half a mile. <laughs> so we would not be, we would lose, I, I don't know the exact number, but five or six acres of output, which could make us 2,000 cases of wine to be able to be certified organic. Now we can do everything else that fits that, but we are gonna be within range of the Napa River and we're gonna be within range of some of our neighbors that are doing a little more conventional farming. Um, Napa in general is, there's probably a lot of brands you've had that are, that are organic or organically produced without being certified, but they don't put it on the label. It's a, once you get into the really higher end beverage industry, there's still a general public that looks at organic as almost a negative, like you're paying too much for lesser quality because you have to be certified organic. That's not true, entirely true. It takes more work. It does cost a little bit more. Um, so we're gonna keep producing it organically with the exception of being that close to the river and and see where we go from there. Um, do we have any questions? Okay. Well, she was first. Okay, in back. Cynthia. This is from Zoom, from Ann Bastin, one of our Green Brewing Committee members. Um, they can be, should I repeat the question? Or should you just knock on your door? Yeah, yeah you can knock on my door, I have samples. The question. Uh, the question is, can they be purchased online through the website? Um, they can be purchased through our website. Uh, sadly, 2020 was a horrible year. So if anybody watched the news, uh, fires mm -hmm. ravaged Napa Valley like they did in 18, like they did in 17. Um, all of our red wine was tainted. Mm. So it, it, the timing of it was, I guess it was good enough that the white wines were harvested. So we harvested our Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc first. So those were in before the fires came. We harvested Malbec, which is a red grape. We harvest a little bit of that early because we make our rosé out of it. So you harvest that before you would harvest the Malbec for red wine. So we had white and pink wine for 2020. We had no red wine, um, which it's a bummer. But 
it, it's, it happened to a lot of Napa Valley and a lot of Sonoma. So once the smoke comes in, the fires really don't, aren't the, the fires themselves are not the threat to a vineyard. A vineyard, those vines are very established, they're very green, there's no brush in between the rows, there's nothing to burn. So their fire, the vineyards themselves are essentially fire stops. But the smoke lingers, and when both mountain ranges on the side of the valley are on fire, the, the smoke will settle into the valley. So the, the smoke enters through the leaves and through the grape skins itself, and that can, doesn't always, but it can taint the grapes. So what did we do is we literally put respirators on and went out and picked them by hand, and then we wash them, and then we do little test fermentation in five gallon Home Depot buckets, uh, Menards buckets. We do each little plot on our lane, so we probably did about 60, um, and all 60 of them were smoked. So if you can imagine, every Menards, Home Depot, and Lowe's was sold out of five gallon buckets <laughs> within 100 miles of anywhere of wine country. Uh, and that includes Oregon, too, because the fires were ripping through Oregon. So yeah, I mean, if you, you find one of your plots wasn't tainted, you can make that wine. Um, what do we do with it? We Now that it's crushed, we find out it's tainted, we bulk sell it. So we sell it to someone with less integrity, <laughs> and they will doctor it the best they can. So they'll use chemicals, they'll use um, grape syrups, and they'll try to mask that and, and still make the wine. Because for them, they can put Napa Valley on the label. And if you put Napa Valley, it already, already carries a stigma. I imagine a lot of that will go to China. Um, no one's really sure, but China's ready to jump if it says Napa. So avoid 2020 Napas, <laughs> unless you really trust the producer. The good producers that will release one, that means they weren't, they, their, their lot wasn't tainted. But we were settled in the valley floor, I mean, it's at three o'clock, at, at 3 a.m. in the morning, it was like dusk, because both mountain ranges are on fire. So you have these huge candles at 3,000 feet, you're down in the valley floor. So it was almost like Alaska in the summer. We didn't, we didn't have night. We had like an uh, eight hour dusk and then day. That, there was another question? Yes, I wanted to ask you about the being close to water. What was the issue with the certified organic? The, to be certified organic vineyard, you, you can't be within a certain range of water that can access any pollutants from anywhere because it's a flowing river, the Napa River. So we, mm -hmm. have, I can't remember the exact number, I, two football fields is in my head is how far your beginning of your vines can be to the Napa River or a lake or, or a, um, a stream. So that's kind of our, that, that's kind of the breaking point for us as far as going USDA organic. Um, we may be there someday uh, as, as maybe we can buy a little more property and be able to pull away from the river. Um, the owner's daughter is, is very instrumental in pushing her dad um, to, to make the winery as green as possible. Follow-up question, I like it. <laughs> I mean, is it really, in your estimation, does that really affect it? I mean, I, if I walked out there right now, it's it, it's at least 75 yards from our first vine to the river, and there's, like almost all rivers, there's a huge tree line on the river. Mm. So I feel like if there was a way to, uh, like, use it, take a sample and say, is this organic? Mm -hmm. I think we'd pass that test. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the main reasons why the Napa Valley Vineyards started the green winery and green vineyard certification. Because there were these little hoopholes once the, once the bureaucracy gets involved in the government that make it hard when you're still being able to produce it organically and you know without using water and without spraying our vines with anything that isn't organic but that, that river is our barrier to being certified. Yes? Do you allow visitors to come? <laughs> Absolutely. And you're all invited for a free tour and tasting at the winery if you come out to California. I got business cards when you come by the tasting. So we roll out the red carpet for anyone from Illinois. Uh, the owner is born and raised in McHenry. His dad is born and raised in McHenry. Um, so if anybody comes out from Illinois, we'll set up a VIP tour and tasting. Mm -hmm. We'll meet you in the parking lot with a literal silver platter of wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
also, can, for me, this is a question, this is part A and B from two different people. Um, is there any good wine in Illinois? And can yes. you do that here? Okay. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, right. So, can you buy can you buy the wine locally as well as the website? Website, yes. Locally, um, we don't have a lot. Um, I, last I checked, there were a couple bottles on the shelf at Garfield's. Okay, don't run, everybody. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you can. We still have we still have ample um, inventory in Napa. We do have an Illinois distributor, so we have the ability to sell to any restaurant. We're talking with Zach about about doing some things here at some point. Um, it is higher end wine, so I mean our wines would retail from twenty five to one hundred fifty dollars a bottle. So if you can imagine, a lot of restaurants are priced out of that. Um, so and that's wholesale cost. That that would be our retail. Okay. So do you have a do you have a liquor license for buying wine? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then oh the other question was about Illinois wine. Um, oh, yeah. Quite frankly, the higher end dry wines of the world, which is really where the the most expensive wines are, are drier in style until you get to some unique expensive dessert wines. Um, they, the vines really need to suffer a little bit. So we, our property is very, um, what we call silty clay loam. Um, it, it isn't tomato or corn or soybean. And, and if you get to, uh, back to where all our grapes come from originally is Bordeaux, France. It's either very clay based on the right bank or very gravelly on the left bank. These yeah. vines are designed to suffer, to find their nutrients, to dig deep roots. Um, quite frankly, the soil's just too good here. <laughs> now, now, and, and the sun's not here as long, you know. So we're we're going to reach at the at the heat of our um, growing season. We're going to be 90 to 95 for two months. So we're sustaining that right when it's ripening time to get the bricks level, to get the sugar level up in that grape to the point where we get. You know, sugar plus yeast is going to make our alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, have I had some Illinois wines that were decent? I, yes, they were a little bit sweeter, and you have to pay a little more because they don't get the yield because they don't have the sun. So, there's. I mean, I worked at 1776 um, back with the old owners with Andy and Terry, and he's he's the wine expert of McHenry County. He really changed the whole um, culture of wine in McHenry County. He had a 700 bottle wine list, he had one bottle of Illinois wine on it, and he was an Illinois restaurant. And it, it was a decent, I mean, I don't even remember what the grape was, it wasn't, it wasn't a typical grape that you'd see. But it was sweet, but it was balanced with acidity. So it's, it's tricky. Um, if you want local wines, the best I find are the Leland Peninsula in northern Michigan. Um, they do make some good dry wines there, but again, the yields are low. So you're going to pay $35 for a good bottle of wine if you went to Oregon. Or Washington and got a $35 bottle of wine, you've got an exceptional bottle of wine. So there's always had that balance. Do you want to support local? Great. But you're just know you're gonna you're gonna drop 30, 40 percent more for a quality level. Yes, I have a question. Just in general, when I go shopping for wine, I always wondered, do they put additives in there like sulfites or any kind of additives into their wine? There's like 140 legal additives you can add into wine, oh, wow. um, and it, it depends on on who you're who you're buying from, and they're not going to put it on their label, they're not going to put it on their website, and you can only trust blogs so far. So it, getting that answer is difficult. I, I know as far as we're concerned, we're minimalist, so the least amount we can. There is sulfites in every wine. Wine doesn't exist without sulfites, um, and if they say no extra added sulfites then they're gambling with the fermentation process. So we do in, induce sulfites to stop the fermentation process where we want the wine to be, where it drinks best. If we did no added sulfites, we might get one out of three years that it worked out. We might get one out of 10. And all those other vintages aren't the best example of what we can produce. Oh, thank you. But you have to taste it. I, I opened the wines about three hours ago, so they should be ready. I, dropped them into Zach's cooler to bring them down temperature. Simple thing, red wine, everyone says red wine room temperature, white wine refrigerator. That's, that's, it's an old adage, but really red wine cellar temperature. White wine above what your typical beer fridge would be. So I use the 2020 rule. So put your reds into your fridge 20 minutes before you drink it, pull your whites out 20 minutes. And you'll be drinking them closer to what the winemaker would want you to drink them out. Exceptions to that, Pinot Noir a little bit colder. Put that Pinot in for 30 minutes. Um, 
sparkling, cold as possible is great. Uh, rosé can be that way too. Any other questions? I probably went over time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, real quick, partly, partly comment, partly question. So, the Illinois thing, we stumbled upon Carbondale wine country accidentally several years ago and found out that at the vineyards, your choices were red and white. That tells you how good they were. Yeah. Um, but then the question is, can't you put up a fence line at a certain distance from the river and say this stuff is organic and this stuff is not? That's a good question. I don't know that answer. Oh. But I think if it was that simple, my boss's daughter would have had daddy doing it right away. Sure. <laughs> so Look it up. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that fence might have to be eight feet down and concrete and 20 feet up. I don't know. But that, that's a good question. The good thing is, is that we're hanging out a little bit to tell you about what we're serving so everybody can um, have, that has any more questions can follow up. Um, we did bring up the food already, and that's um, getting cold. So I want to make sure that you guys get that while that's still warm as well. So don't mean to cut you short. No, no, we're good. I got wine for people to taste. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and I think we'll just right. do announcements so, if you guys want. want to give a thank you please to Zach and Brian and Beth. Food in while we're having announcements, I can carry them in there. Do you want to have some? Or, or we can wait. We can try to make the announcements go faster. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is your super fast announcement from the food shed. We are still looking at everything that you guys have been so incredibly generous with as far as our CIC. So things are still being tabulated. So stay on the edge of your seats. We will have an announcement soon. But I can tell you about our holiday boxes. We still have some left. Please go on the website. It's all locally sourced stuff. Comes from Woodstock, comes from Crystal Lake. And good things, great gifts. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else right here? Yeah, great. You actually don't need the you mic. You don't need the mic. Yeah. Oh, we're off soon. Okay. But you have oh. really cool oh, hands. Yeah. 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 Yeah